Stand for prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Sorrowful and Immaculate Heart of Mary. Most Sacred Heart of Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. When we pray, when we study, when we try to do good things, we often wonder why it's so hard. It doesn't have to be always hard, but the devil and all his minions don't make it easy for us. The good angels always encourage us to pray, to study, to do good. But the bad angel is always doing the opposite, trying to make it difficult for us, make it dry, make it a chore. Now, obviously, anything worth doing is worth doing well. And in doing well, we often have to persevere, put a lot of effort into the thing that matters, the thing that we love, which makes sense. Why would we want it otherwise? It's the same with anything we do. It's just that with original sin and our wounding, the wounds of original sin keep us in this constant spiritual warfare. And that being the case, the devil is often trying to exploit those weaknesses. Now, normally we would like to say it's covered with grace, that it's normally um, calmed by grace, that eventually those things would go away. Perhaps there have been saints who have conquered themselves completely by grace and asceticism. They have conquered themselves to the point where those are no longer a big issue for them. But we would never think to ourselves that we are going to completely conquer them and be free in this life. Because just as we do think, at the moment when we think, ah, I've gotten rid of that. <sighs> there comes the evil serpent's head. And one of the vices attacks us, at least by temptation, suggestion. So we always have to be on the spiritual warfare. We always have to have our weapons ready. And the devil knows this too. <clears throat> and one thing that struck a great blow to society to the Catholic faith, Catholic Christendom, which makes it much harder culturally to live as Catholics, is the whole French Revolution. The French Revolution was devastating to the, to the Catholic culture, as was the Reformation. It's true. Every time the devil thinks that there's going to be some kind of great boon of Catholicism, then he hits a heart. The devil, of course, only works by what God allows. And so you have to accept and understand that something greater must always be coming when the devil gets his way and he tests men. It's usually after the men have started to reject something of God or gotten too proud. But then the devil gets his way and then God brings something around that's even greater, even better. Now, with the French Revolution, I want to just mention a couple of principles before we get some more education and instruction on prayer, which we covered last time. Remember, the last class that we had a couple of weeks ago I was talking about the Our Father, the first part of the Our Father, and we want to learn how to pray well. And the Our Father, from the Council of Trent instruction, teaches us how to pray well, how we should pray, for what we should pray, when we should pray. But before we do that, as I say, I want you to understand that in the French Revolution, there were a few aims of this terror, as we call it, the terror of the revolution. And it's something of what we see today. There's this constant seeming cycle of history of the good conquering, and then the men getting proud, and then God punishes them, and then they, they resurface, and the devil tries to get his way to get as many souls away from Christ as he can. And this being Christ the King, the feast of Christ the King, we must never forget there's a constant battle. We have a spiritual warfare, but we're not alone. Our Lord is at the head of it. Our Lord is the King. And the devil knows this, as I say, and so he's trying to destroy certain things in order to make it harder to go to God, harder to save souls. And what is that? I'll tell you what happened at the time of the French Revolution, and you can apply it to today, perhaps. The aim of the terror of the revolution 
was a war on civilization, Catholic, Christian, to attain absolute equality. Now, what's happening today? I would say anything we're suffering through today, any woke agenda, is just a continuation of the aim of terror. It is this um, desire, goal, to wage war on any Catholic remnants, any civilization of Christianity, to obtain an absolute equality. Well, we know that doesn't work. I've already told you before in previous catechism classes, you could go back and look, that we, we rely on an inequality, God being better than us, and everything in between. Even you and your families, there's not an equality in the family. The equality that you have in the family, husbands and wives, is because of your sacrament of matrimony. That makes you equal. But in an administration, the accomplishment of that, there can't be equality. There has to be some kind of, somebody does what somebody else says. Somebody else makes a, somebody makes a decision so everybody follows. Otherwise, nobody would do anything. For instance, I mean, in each one of our homes, we have our own rules as a family. But what would those rules mean if we didn't follow the rules of the larger society? Everything around that extends out. Somebody's better than me. And that's the thing about the, the errors of the revolutions, whatever one there, that you want to talk about, whether it be way, way back against the early church or even more recently the Reformation and then the revolution of the French, um, the French Revolution or communism. It's always the same. Watch their pattern. Bring everything down to an equality. Pretend to give everybody equality. Now, when you've given up all of your differences, then the powers that be become dictators. And they can tell you what to do. But, oh, you're all equal. I'm just more important, says the dictator. Because you're all equal, you can't think outside of the sheeple of that level of thinking. And this is not just as we see it today in politics. This is even in religion. There is not an equality in religion. So the aim of the terror was a war on civilization to attain an absolute equality. And that was the destruction of the bourgeoisie. Robespierre said, internal dangers come from the bourgeoisie. In order to conquer the bourgeois, we must rouse the people, we must procure arms for them and make them angry. End of his quote. And then we go to Herbert, who said, the virtue of the holy guillotine, that was a special knife that was developed by Dr. Guillotine as a very humane way of execution. The virtue of the holy guillotine will gradually deliver the republic from the rich, the bourgeois, the spies, the fat farmers, and the worthy tradesmen, as from the priests and aristocrats. That was his wor those were his words. Because the priests and the aristocrats represented an inequality. And what do we see today in the church? I've talked to too many priests. You know this is the case. Priests don't want to look like priests. Priests don't want to be better than the faithful. It's always inequality. A lane of the playing field. Everything's horizontal, nothing vertical. Well, also it was the destruction of the educated. And the purpose of the terror, French Revolution, was to destroy the educated. It was said, this is a quote, all highly educated men were persecuted. It was enough to have some knowledge, to be a man of letters, in order to be arrested as an aristocrat. How many of us here would be arrested as aristocrats because we went to college? Because we took some higher science and believed that God is God? It was also the destruction of the arts, commerce, libraries. It's another quote. What are you doing, pusillanimous workmen, in these industrial occupations by which opulence degrades you? Come out of the servitude and confront the rich man who oppresses you. Well, that's what we were hearing with white privilege and all of that. Overthrow his fortune. Overthrow these edifices. The wreckage belongs to you. It is thus that you will rise to the sublime equality, the basis of the true liberty, the vigorous principles of a warrior people to whom com commerce and arts should be unnecessary. Silly, 
but people buy that. Hopefully we don't buy that. The arts, commerce, libraries, education, levels of people that run the society are necessary. Otherwise you get chaos. And then also, they were trying to destroy, and they did to a great degree, politeness, just politeness, just decorum, decency, modesty. Monsieur and Madame, those words were outlawed. It's just like saying Mr. and Mrs. But for the French, Monsieur and Madame, no. Can't say that. It became necessary to be unkept with dirty nails and unrefined appearance in order to keep your head attached to your neck. You couldn't look special. You couldn't look clean. You could not look like you were civilized. Otherwise, you were under suspicion. You might be one of those papists. You might be one of those Catholics. You might be one of those aristocrats. The problem, despite the elimination of all of these elements at the time of the terror, which we see today, even in our society, even though we don't call it terror, we feel the terror, these elements are being destroyed today. And what's the problem? The common people, like us, still retained a liking for the hierarchy, respect, religion. So the problem was, <laughs> and eventually, after murdering thousands, they figured out that the people were aristocratic because they're Catholic. So what are you going to do? Ex execute all the people? Well, they tried. They just started from the top and started going right on down, trying anybody who showed any support, anybody who showed any um, agreement with these issues that they were trying to destroy. He was suspect. The problem was, as I say, even though they tried to get rid of these things, the people themselves showed a liking for the hierarchy, a liking for respect, a liking for religion. The people were aristocratic. And so what did they do? The solution for the, for the revolutionary was to purge society, purge the people. And they tried to kill so many people that you would never even think of as aristocratic, just people trying to go about their business and live their daily life. But because they had culture, because they had civilization. So what was it? Again, the ultimate aim, dechristianization, persecution of the clergy, destruction of whatever might represent order in God, and the schismatic church was put in place. These things come back around, as I say. Not always in the same apparel, they don't always wear the same clothing, but they have the same principles. We need to learn to pray well. Perhaps it was as requested of the king by the sacred heart of Jesus. You need to consecrate. You need to wear this image. You need to, you need to make yourself um, a servant of the sacred heart. Well, he delayed, he did delay, delayed, and then therefore the French Revolution came around. So Really, it's allegiance to God. And how are we going to do that? It's through our prayer. And prayer is the elevation of the heart to God. This we know. Uh, I say it again. Prayer is the elevation of the heart to God. Now, last time we spoke of our Father. There's a couple more things that we can say from the Council of Trent. Um, the duties that we owe our Heavenly Father, and then dispositions that we need to have. If you want further, some of you have this already, if you want further explanation on prayer, which is more of a commentary, it comes from Father's book, The Catechism Explained. This I mentioned before, an exposition of the Christian religion a special reference to the present state of society and the spirit of the age, a practical manual for the use of preacher, the catechist, teacher, and the family by Reverend Father Francis Spirago. Spirago. So it's the um, Council of Trent Catechism that he mostly references. But in there, he talks about the nature of prayer 
and prayer is the elevation of the heart to God. So you can find a lot of good tidbits in here. He'll ask a question or make a statement, then he'll follow it up with paragraphs of explanation, some of which I'll just draw on from today as soon as we cover these duties we owe our Heavenly Father. The faithful should be reminded of all that they owe in return to God, their most loving Father, so they may be aware of the extent of the love, piety, obedience, and respect they are bound to render to him who has created them, who watches over them, who has redeemed them, and with what hope and trust they should invoke him. But to enlighten the ignorant and correct the false ideas such as imagine prosperity and success in life to be the only test that God preserves and maintains his love towards us. So what does that mean? There are many souls, many people, who judge whether they have a lot of money, whether they're happy in this life, as whether God loves them. But to enlighten, says the Council of Trent, the ignorant and correct the false idea of those who imagine that prosperity and success are the sign of God's love, that adversities and trials which come from his hand are a sign that he's not well disposed towards us, and that he entertains hostile dispositions towards us. It will be necessary to point out that even if the hand of the Lord sometimes presses us heavily, presses heavily upon us, it is by no means because he is hostile to us. But by striking us, he heals us. And the wounds coming from God are remedies. You know this from the Old Testament. Did God hate his people? No. Did he correct his people? Definitely. Many times? Definitely. But he always gave them a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. He chastises sinners so as to improve them by this lesson and inflicts temporal punishments in order to deliver them from eternal torments. For though he visits our iniquities with a rod and our sins with stripes, yet his mercy he will not take away from us. Yep. So all the talk of mercy in today's society, especially with the chaplet or devotion of mercy, Mercy Sunday and all of that, has never been different. Even though God has to use justice, just like a father of a family, it's always with charity. It's always with this mercy. Come back, come back. The faithful, therefore, should be recommended to recognize in such chastisements the fatherly love of God, ever to have in their hearts and on their lips the saying of Job, who we heard about a couple Sundays ago, Actually, last Sunday was the offertory of Job, but the priests have been reading. Oh, I guess for a couple weeks now, we've read different passages from Job. <clears throat> the most patient of men was Job. He woundeth and careth. He striketh, and his hand shall heal. As well as to repeat frequently the words written by Jeremiah in the name of the people of Israel. Thou hast chastised me, and I was instructed as a young bullock, unaccustomed to the yoke. Convert me and I shall be converted, for thou art the Lord my God. And keep before thy, their eyes the example of Tobias, who recognized the loss of his sight, in the loss of his sight, the paternal hand of God raised against him, and cried, Bless thee, O Lord God of Israel, because thou hast chastised me, and thou hast saved me. Sometimes a little drawing on the board helps us to remember this visually. Who are we meant for? Who are we going towards? God. The Trinity. And all in between along the road are moments of grace, moments of time in which we're asked to either turn away from him or turn towards him by, after we've turned away from him by conversion. Or to beware, because at any one of these moments, we could aversio, which means turn away from God, have aversion. So watch out. Be careful. Turn back. These are moments of grace. The moment of grace is like a Y in the road. 
I might see a fork, but if you ever see a fork in the road, make sure you take it. So why in the road? Here we come. Coming to the why in the road. This is a moment of sacrifice. This is a moment of pride, I'll say. This is a moment of humility. This is also a moment of sin. Which one will you take when you come to the Y in the road? Each one of those marks between us and God is marked by this choice. Will we turn away from God by pride and sin? Will we turn to God or continue? But normally it's a conversion. Each one of these steps is a conversion because we have a choice, right? We're standing here, and we say we can choose either way. We have free will. We have free will to choose. That's us standing there that, that you are here. And you're going to make a choice, and this conversion is happening all the time. It's happening all the time, no matter what happens. Because these little marks of time are not just joys and everything that make us so happy. No, because as I said, making a choice, it could be like this. This could be, this could be uh, a moment of pain. This could be, this could be the moment of um, pleasure. And the pain of the pleasure tends to camouflage the importance behind the choice. Oh, painful? Avoid that. Pleasure? Of course. Let's take that. Not necessarily. So, as we're seeing here, as Holy Mother Church and the Council of Trent wants us to remember, the faithful therefore should be recommended to recognize that God in his fatherly love gives us many things, both good and bad, it seems, joys and sorrows. Like Holy Job, I mentioned him. In this connection, the faithful should be particularly on their guard against believing that any calamity or affliction that befalls them can take place without the knowledge of God. For we have his own words. A hair of your head shall not perish. Let them rather find consolation in that divine oracle read in the apocalypse. Those whom I love, I rebuke and chastise. And let them find comfort in the exhortation addressed by St. Paul to the Hebrews. My son, neglect not the discipline of the Lord, neither be thou wearied whilst thou art rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chastiseth, and he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. But if you, if you without chastisement, be without chastisement, use some pretty strong words here, you are bastards, not sons. Moreover, if we have the fathers of our flesh for instructors and we reverence them, shall we not much more obey the Father's spirits and live? You know, I told you before, just the pedagogy, the pedagogy of raising children requires that the Father sometimes be stern, sometimes punish. And is there any one of us here who says, I don't deserve any punishment. I've never done anything wrong. Well, we'll certainly find out pretty quick in purgatory whether that's true. Because God is such a refining fire. We have to pass through his refining fire in order to have him for eternity. Our, the word our, got to say something about that. When we evoke the Father, when each of us calls him our Father, we are to understand thereby that from the privilege and gift of divine adoption... It necessarily follows that the faithful are brethren and should love each other. Maybe we don't think about that. We see our Father who art in heaven. We already get on to the art in heaven before we even think about the our Father. If we're saying our Father, we are saying, unless our words are empty, we are saying that he is our Father, our Father. So therefore, it makes us brothers, sisters, brethren, better said. And if that's the case, this is why the apostles in their epistles address all the faithful as brethren. Not because, I don't know, 
we're all sitting together? No. When a priest says, or the, the apostles, the disciples said, brethren, dear brethren, it's because you have a common father. Our father. Another necessary consequence of this adoption, it's a true adoption, is not, or is that, not only are the faithful thereby united in the bonds of brotherhood, but that the son of God being truly man, we are called and really are his brethren also. So you take a look at this. This is our path of life. We're in this together. Every one of these steps that's taken, we don't just do it alone. Think of all the people that are involved in every one of the sins that I commit. When I averse from God, which would be sin, and converse to God because of conversion by grace, somebody else is involved. That's the way it is. It doesn't just affect me. Think of a father who's gone through his life uh, not taking care of his Catholic family, and he converts. He turns back to God. He is now a channel of grace for his family. But he says, boy, I converted, but my family, they're a mess. What do I do? What can happen? Well, keep on the straight and narrow path. That's what can happen. Keep that channel open between you and God, and they will benefit. But the opposite is true, too. A priest, I'll take myself as an example. A priest who doesn't no longer believes in the real presence, no longer wishes to save souls, no longer lives like a priest and falls into his vices. Who's affected? All the faithful. All the faithful suffer because he's no longer the father. He's no longer the leader. No longer the channel of grace. No longer using his consecrated hands to bless. People do if and are affected by our actions, by our way of living. We don't, we don't just take these steps through life of grace or sin alone. We are part of a brethren. Holy Mother Church likes to emphasize that really hard. You know, the sins of the, of the faithful, the graces of the faithful affect everybody. You know this is true at the Mass. Every time a Mass is said, it affects and benefits everybody. Every time there's a revolution <laughs> against the law and order and the grace and faith, it affects everybody. These words of our Lord, go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there they shall see me. These words, as we know, he pronounced only after his resurrection and when he had already put on immortality, our Lord, with his resurrected body, thus showing that no one is at liberty to imagine that the bonds of brotherhood with us have been severed by his resurrection and ascension into heaven. Not only has the resurrection of Christ not dissolved this union and love, but we know that one day, when from his throne of grace, majesty he shall judge, glory and majesty, he shall judge mankind of all ages. And he will call even the very least of the faithful by the name of brethren. Indeed, how can we be other than brethren of Christ, seeing that we are called his co-heirs by St. Paul? Doubtless he is the first begotten, the appointed heir of all things. But we are begotten in the second place after him and are his co-heirs according to the measure of heavenly gifts we receive, according to the extent of the charity by which we sow ourselves servants and cooperatives of the Holy Ghost. I give you another little commentary of my own here. If we stop and look at how the modern churchmen, their thinking is on this level of revolution and equality, then how is it that any one of us can ever as we just read, we are co-heirs according to the measure of heavenly gifts we receive. That's an inequality. And according to the extent of the charity by which we show ourselves servants and cooperators of the Holy Ghost. Is everybody practicing the same charity, cooperating with the Holy Ghost at the same level, and are they receiving the same measure of heavenly gifts? No. We all have the opportunity to receive many gifts. 
We, we all have, let's say, the same treasure chest to go up and pull out of. We're not all pulling the same thing. We're not all pulling the same level. There's an inequality always, even the sanctification of each one of our souls. And it's, it's seen that the powers above want to just get rid of that too. That way, we're no better than a pagan, even though you've been baptized, you've been many years to sacraments of confession and communion. That's just what you had to do, because you felt that way. Not that it was needed. Not that there's a difference. You see how this has ramifications through society and in, right into the core of our hearts, the spirituality of our hearts, that equality is wrong. There's a certain equality that's necessary to run society, as I said, husband and wife, in the bond of matrimony. But Holy Mother Church, the Council of Trent is telling us, we will be judged, we will be co-heirs, we will receive our place in heaven according to the heavenly gifts we receive, the extent of charity by which we show ourselves servants and cooperators of the Holy Ghost. He it is who by his inspirations moves and inflames us to virtue, good works, in order that we may be strengthened by his grace, valiantly to undertake the combat that must be waged to secure salvation. How many times you and I have been outraged, inflamed, and disingenuous with the injustice that's done when we see that one of your cooperators, co, co um, I don't know, what do you want to call them? Uh, office assistants, whatever they are, they just sit there on their bum. They hardly do any work, and you do all the work, and yet they're given the same treasure as you are in payment. Does that make sense to you? Has it ever made sense to us? Do we feel happy about that? Oh, that's so nice. Look at that. We all get paid the same. He doesn't have to do anything. I do all the work. That's never made sense. It doesn't make sense in the spiritual life, and it doesn't make sense on the path to heaven. So what kind of disposition do you want to accompany the words, Our Father? St. John Chrysostom says, God listens willingly to the Christians who pray. Any Christian who prays not only for himself, but for others. Because to pray for ourselves is an inspiration of nature. To pray for others is an inspiration of grace. I'll read it again. God listens willingly to Christians. The Christian who prays not only for himself, but for others. Because to pray for ourselves is an inspiration of nature. <laughs> I need help. But to pray for others is an inspiration of grace. Necessity compels us to pray for ourselves. I need food. I need a place to live. I need to educate these children. I need to live in good union with my wife, my husband, uh, society. I need everything I need to progress, to be secure. Well, that's easy, in a way, because we know that. But as St. John Chrysostom says, whereas fraternal charity calls us to pray for others. And he adds, the prayer which is inspired by fraternal charity is more agreeable to God than that which is dictated by necessity. I used to say that a lot of people, like at Y2K, I remember the reaction in many people, we'll call them Christians, but people, was to pray more, to be more religious, to go back to the church when they become irreligious or you know, wanting no organized religion. They became such uh, devoted people. Why? Because Y2K was coming and things could collapse and get bad. So sort of necessity to cover one's skin, to protect one's backside. Hmm. So I said, it's interesting how people pull God out like a little dog. Come with me. Oh, you're on the leash here. Oh, boy, you're serving the purpose well. Serving the purpose well. All right, all right. I'm done. I'm tired. I have no use for for you, little dog, so I'll put you away in the kennel. We treat God like that. We often just pull him out when it's necessary to make us feel better. God on the little dog leash. 
It also happens when people have serious problems in their families. I know of a case where a man, <clears throat> a man, he, uh, his wife came down with cancer. And boy, he became very religious. He wasn't a bad man before, a Catholic, certainly. But just more occupied with his worldly things. And by the time I met him, he was probably older than 60 years old. And he and his wife were good people. They often hosted me when I traveled through a certain city. Good people. But not very religious, not very prayerful. But yet when his wife had a threat of cancer, boy, he was prayerful. His rosaries, he would go to mass, he would make confession and communion. And then, after she got better, well, you know, it's not quite so dire right now. So I don't have to do all those things. Dog on a leash. God is like a dog on a leash for many of us. So Holy Mother Church is saying, with St. John Chrysostom, pray for others. And it shows a fraternal charity. What are the dispositions we should have when God is the common father for all of us? Pray for others. Have a fraternal charity, which is more agreeable to God than what is dictated by necessity. In connection with the important subject of solitary prayer, the pastor, that's myself or any priest, should be careful to remind and exhort all the faithful of this universal brotherhood that binds them, and consequently ever to treat each other as friends and brothers, and never to seek arrogantly to raise oneself above their neighbors. So that's the beauty, right, of equality, is in prayer. There's never going to be an equality perfectly in society or anywhere around us because we rely on somebody to be better than us. Otherwise, nothing would happen. Nothing would be organized. But in the level of prayer and the level of loving God and helping one another, we are equal. But that's exactly where we don't want to be equal. Isn't that funny? We want to be equal in all the things that says non servion. And then in the things where we should be serving, yeah, we're, we're not there. The things is, is backwards. It's backwards. And all the material things, we want to be always nobody better than me. But then in the things that are spiritual, we should be equalizing in prayer and helping one another. But we don't do that. And though there are in the Church of God various great gradations of office, you know this, Pope on down to the least, little baptized soul, yet the, this diversity of dignity and position is in no way destroys the bond of fraternal charity. And that's the beautiful thing too. No matter how high you are in the hierarchy of the church, in the hierarchy of society, you're still bound in the equality of fraternal charity. And that's why... It really bothers us when somebody who is above us and has more knowledge of their position is more important than ours, and they treat us like scum. That bothers us. It's arrogant, especially if we're the same family, the Catholic Church. Or somebody from below who condemns the higher guy, oh, you just don't know what it's like. You shouldn't have what you have. That type of spirit is it's not fraternal. It's not charitable. Just as in the human body... There's not an equality, I tell you. In the human body, the various uses and different functions of our organ is in no way cause that this or that part of the body lose the name or the office of the organ of the body. The brain saying to the others, you're not as important as I am. No, and maybe not in the order of uh, importance but the order of necessity, <laughs> the order of function, well, brain, you'll just die off if I stop beating for a few minutes, says the heart. So we don't lose our name, just like in the human body, just because one organ is better than the other doesn't make everybody else lose their place. Take, for instance, one who wields kingly power. If he's a Christian, is he not the brother of all of those united in the communion of the Christian faith? Yes, beyond all doubt. And why? Because, there's not one, because there is not one God giving existence to the rich and noble and another giving existence to the poor and the subjects. There's only one God. Imagine how much easier it is when you're a pagan and you can have all the gods you wish for certain things and... 
Therefore, you can lower it over there as well. Our God said, your God helps you to till the field. Our God says, collect all the money. We need to have a filial confidence and piety when we pray under our Father. Do not forget, O oh Christians, all of us here, that when about to address this prayer to God, you ought to approach him as a son, a son going to the Father. If only we had that same filial piety when we say the Our Father at the Rosary or any time. I like to say the five Our Fathers in honor of our Lord's five wounds. We have to have this approach to God through that prayer as a son or a daughter, but as a child. That's all the Holy Mother Church is saying. Approach God when you say these prayers as a child. Filial confidence and piety. The words are of our Father. You should consider the rank to which God in his goodness has raised you. When he commands you to fly to him, Knowing God is so awesome and powerful and quote-unquote unapproachable, the fact that he, he, through Jesus Christ, gave us the Our Father is an invitation to come to him closer, which we don't deserve. We don't deserve of our nature. We deserve because of his invitation. His come to the wedding feast, he says. Come to me. Come up higher. Our Father is like the key to opening the heart of the Trinity, so we can get to God the Father. So, he commands you to fly to him, not as a timid and fearful servant to the master, but willingly and confidently like a child to its father. In the remembrance and in this thought, consider with what fervor and piety we should pray. Endeavor to act as becomes a child of God. That is to say, see that your prayers and actions are never unworthy of that divine origin. And then to finish, to finish today, he who never prays cannot save his soul. He who never prays cannot save his soul. For without prayer, he will fall into grievous sin. Imagine a servant who saluted his, never saluted his master, never said hello. Were one to look into hell, we should see that the majority of souls have been lost through neglect of prayer. If our Lord says, if our Lord says, St. Ambrose, spend whole nights in prayer, what ought not we poor mortals to do to save our souls? He who does not pray is powerless to resist in the hour of temptation. Vigilati et orati. Watch him pray, said our Lord. He would be compared to a warrior without weapons, a bird without wings, a ship without sails or rudder. He is a reed driven to and fro by every blast of wind. St. John Chrysostom says, one who does not pray has no life in him. He has ceased to breathe. He has no breath. He will faint. He will die. And we know that he will die the death if he does not pray. As corn must be stored in barns, not left lying on the damp ground, or it will grow moldy and decay, so the heart of man must not continually rest upon earthly things. He must be lifted up to God, or will lose its purity. Hence, our Lord bids us watch and pray. Vigilati et orati. All the nations of the world worship some deity or other. The obligation to pray is imprinted on our hearts. We need to talk to someone that's bigger than us, greater than us. It's imprinted on us to ask for help. That finishes for today. We'll stand and say our prayer. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.